Well, to begin with, what I'd like to talk about is the libertarian vote total. Because there have been a lot of emails buzzing around the Internet the last three days. Various libertarians either pointing with pride or viewing with alarm the fact that the libertarian candidate got 380,000 votes in this election. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 380,000 votes. It may be by the time they count all the ballots, it'll be a little over 400,000. Who knows? The important point that is that it's around four-tenths of one percent or a little less than that. And... Uh, a lot of people are holding this up as a, an example of why the Libertarian Party shouldn't even run a presidential candidate, that it just is not worth the trouble for the little bit of results that it gets. But I beg to differ with them, and I think we need to put this whole thing into perspective. To begin with, the Libertarian Party, as is the case for the Green Party, Natural Law Party, or any of the other third parties, as they're called, the Libertarian Party faces what is really, at the moment, an insurmountable group of barriers. There are all sorts of legal obstacles that have been placed in the way of third-party candidates trying to run for president. We've discussed some of them on this show, and it's important to realize that America is not a two-party system because of popular demand, but it's a two-party system because the two parties have passed laws at the state and federal level to make absolutely sure that no third party gets a share of the pie. And there are really five major ways that these obstacles are placed in the way of third parties. The first is the limits on campaign donations, which is far more detrimental to third parties than it is to the two major parties who can promise all sorts of benefits to heads of law firms or uh, CEOs of corporations who are in a position to do the fundraising for the candidates and commit to getting maybe 100 donations of $2,000 each, $200,000 achieved by one phone call. A third party can't do that. It has nothing to offer in return. It can't say, I'll get you a trade restriction on foreign trade so that you will not have as much competition. Or it can say we'll, uh, to a group of lawyers that we'll make sure to get a law passed that will open the door to far more law lawsuits and so forth. The second barrier is the reporting uh, requirements. And this is the reason that so many people donate to both the Republican and Democratic parties, because they don't want to take a chance on being on the losing side and getting recriminations against them from the winners. There again, libertarians, of course, don't fit into the syndrome. The third area is ballot access. At state uh, legislatures all around the country, laws have been passed to make it very, very difficult for Republican and, pardon me, uh, third-party candidates to get on the ballot, and those same difficulties do not apply to Republicans and Democrats. And we've gone into that before, so I'm not going to take your time with it right now. The fourth area are subsidies. The Democrats and Republicans both get subsidies from the federal government to run their campaigns. I qualified for the subsidy, of course not as big a subsidy, but I qualified for a subsidy in 96 and 2000. But how in the world could I accept the subsidy? I railed against individuals on welfare. I railed against corporations on welfare. So I'm going to take welfare myself? Of course not. So a party like the Libertarian Party is at an automatic disadvantage because it would be a violation of principle to accept that subsidy. And the fifth area is the debate. The, the debate commission is run by Republicans and Democrats, so surprise, surprise, no third-party candidates get into the debates. And you've got 50 million people watching. Can you imagine a libertarian candidate in one of those debates pointing out that you shouldn't even have to pay income tax at all, that if the federal government was limited to the Constitution, there'd be no income tax necessary, pointing out that we don't lead, need to live in a state of siege if we would just get rid of this aggressive foreign policy, and so on down the line. So obviously, we're not going to get into those debates. These are barriers that cannot be wished away. These are barriers that are not going to be overcome by some catchy slogan, by focusing on some particular issue, or by running a candidate who's pure or less pure, or whatever you want to come up with as your favorite little trick that's going to change everything. It isn't going to change all of these laws that are stacked against third parties. All right, but how then can these things be overcome? It is possible to overcome them, but I only know of two ways. Now, you may be able to think of a third or fourth way, but so far I know of only two ways. One is to run a candidate who is so wealthy, so wealthy, that he could put 10, 20, 30, 40 million dollars of his money into the campaign, just outright making a gift to the campaign. That's the only way you can get around the campaign finance laws, is if the candidate himself puts his own money into the campaign. But it's going to take a very wealthy man, and then you're going to have to hope and pray that he really does present the libertarian message. First of all, that he presents it in a pure way and doesn't say, well, of course, uh, we need some gun control laws. And, oh, yes, uh, of course, obviously, I would want to continue the laws against crack cocaine, but we could uh, loosen them on medical marijuana or something like that so that you have no principles involved that people can relate to and then carry on their own away from the campaign and apply those principles to forthcoming issues that come up the year after or the year after that and realize that, no, I don't want government involved in these areas. You've got to have a candidate running on a pure libertarian message or there's no point in having the campaign at all. But that's 
that's one way. We find somebody who's got the wealth to do it. And incidentally, I said 10, 20, 30, 40 million dollars. The Republicans and Democrats will each spend over 100 million dollars, but they waste a tremendous amount of money attacking each other. If you're presenting a positive image, as we would, where our issues are all on how much better your life could be, you can do wonders with just $10 million, let alone 20 or 30, where you really could make a dent, where you really could turn people's heads. The second way we can overcome the barriers is by having a much bigger party. If we had a party of 200,000 members in the Libertarian Party, then the fundraising base would be so large that we could raise the 10 or 20 or $30 million. I've been talking about the Libertarian presidential campaign, and uh, to those who are waiting on the phones, my apologies if you can just be patient, because I do want to cover this. I think it's very important to realize what we're doing here and where we're going with Libertarian activities. I mentioned that the only two ways that we can overcome the institutional barriers is by running a very wealthy candidate who's willing to put gobs and gobs of his own money, and not just a half a million dollars or a million dollars, but 10 or 20 or 30 million dollars in to run a really first-class campaign. Either that or build a party that is so big that we will have a fundraising base that will produce that kind of money for a presidential campaign. All right. Some people, though, say the LP, the Libertarian Party, shouldn't even be running a presidential campaign, that it's a waste of time. When you only get 400,000 votes, what are you doing bothering with this, consuming all this money, and so on? Far better to be focusing on local races where we have a chance to win, and we have won local races. I don't know how many libertarian office holders we have right off the top of my head, but it is somewhere, I believe, between 500 and 1,000 right now, and we could have more if all that money were put into it. But what those people don't realize is that despite the low vote totals, the libertarian presidential campaign is the most important event that takes place in all of libertarian outreach. You take all of the libertarian organizations, all the libertarian think tanks, all of these organizations, and all of them put together do not contribute as much to outreach as the libertarian presidential campaign does. And in case I forget to say it later, I'll say it now, that I am not denigrating other libertarian organizations. Many of them, in their own way, are more effective or more efficient, anyway, than the libertarian party is. They do tremendous work. I rely on the work of Cato and the Reason Foundation and other places, the Independent Institute, to get information that wouldn't be available elsewhere. But in terms of outreach, there is nothing that even begins to compare with the libertarian presidential campaign. Because... The libertarian presidential candidate has access to the media that no one else has. When I was running for president in 2000, I was on 55 national television shows. Now, they wouldn't have had me on at any other time. I can get on national television shows uh, when I want to, uh, but I can't get on 55 of them in a nine-month period. I was on 90 national radio shows and hundreds and hundreds of local radio and television shows. I was on national, uh, I was interviewed for national publications like the USA Today, the Associated Press, uh, the LA Times Syndicate, and so on and so on and so on, plus a, a lot of Internet interviews. And this kind of publicity is not available elsewhere. And it was available to me to do two things, to tell people that it doesn't have to be this way. There is no reason that we should have to pay these high taxes because we're not getting anything for them. There's no reason we should have to live in a state of siege as we were even before 9-11. And, of course, now it's been multiplied several times over. That there is no reason that you should have to be in a bankrupt system like Social Security. That there's no reason that we should put up with the crime rates we do. Uh, that if we could get rid of the gun laws and get rid of the drug war, we could bring crime down tremendously. And these ideas that people would never hear, listening to commentary shows, listening to the Republican and Democratic candidates for President, Congress, or any other office... And that platform was available to me as a presidential candidate. It was available to Michael Badnarik this year as the Libertarian presidential candidate. And you can't get it any other way. And more important, it is not in the form of written literature that most people do not read. That just if you give it to people, it piles up in the corner if it isn't already in the wastebasket. But this is outreach that goes to people where they are now, sitting and watching television or listening to the radio while in their cars. It was a tremendous platform. And that's why I think that the Libertarian Party's presidential campaign is the most effective form of outreach we have. Get rid of that, and you have nothing. You really do have nothing. Every day, almost, I receive an email from somebody else who says, you know, I didn't know about any of this stuff until I saw you on C-SPAN, or I happened to hear you on the radio in 96 or in 2000. And I can't tell you how many hundreds of people have told me that over the last few years. And if hundreds of them have gone to the trouble of letting me know about it, you can imagine the thousands of them that were affected by it, and must have been affected this year by hearing Michael Badnarik on radio or television. Not only that, 
This national platform that exists is indispensable to local candidates. So if you think local candidate races are important, then what you need is a national presidential campaign to build name recognition for the libertarian label. Those local candidates can hope to get on one, two, three, maybe four shows during their campaign in the local area. But those same people in the local area could be exposed to as many as several dozen shows that the national presidential candidate has been on and is talking about the libertarian label and what it means to be a libertarian. And so there is a tremendous amount that the presidential campaign can do for the local campaigns. And, of course, in turn, the local campaigns also help the national campaign. Looking at it this way, it becomes even doubly important that the libertarian candidate present a pure libertarian message, that he is not confused with the Republicans or the Democrats. And the principle that I feel that every candidate must adhere to is never propose anything, never preach anything that could have been said by a Republican or Democratic candidate. If you're taking a position on an issue that is the same as, as many Republicans are taking or many Democrats are taking, then shut up about it, because all you do is confuse people then. What you need to do is to present something that is totally different, that is so much better than what the other candidates are presenting that people will sit up and take notice. They may not vote for you because they're only going to hear you once, perhaps. But if they hear you and hear that there is something better, they at least have opened their minds to the possibility that maybe the answers aren't to be found in the same old way. And then when somebody else comes along and says, you know, libertarians believe such and such, then this reinforces what you have said. And enough times hearing that over a period of time, they're finally going to get the point. I've been talking about the libertarian presidential campaign and uh, just a few more thoughts about it, and that is that the vote total is meaningless. Michael Badnerick got around 400,000 votes. If he had gotten 200,000 votes, I would not have considered his campaign a failure. If he had gotten 600,000 votes, I would not have considered it to be a greater success. In this range, the vote total is meaningless. Now, if he'd gotten 3 million votes, that would have been a different story because that would have changed the media's perception. It might have changed the pollster's perception. It might have meant that a lot more would be available to libertarians in the future because they would be treated as spoilers, which is not what we want to be, but at least would get us greater access to the media. But anywhere under a million votes, and really under two or three million votes, is really meaningless, and so it doesn't matter how many votes he got. He went out and worked as hard as he could and did the best he could. What is important is how many inquiries the LP got as a result of this, the Libertarian Party. How many new people will join the party in the future? And I got an email from... Uh, Joe out there in cyberspace saying both your solutions, that is running a wealthy individual or having a much larger party, sound like wishful thinking to me. I don't think they are. The wealthy individual, I think that's kind of a silver bullet pipe dream, that a, a fantasy that a lot of people have. But the larger party is not. The party undertook back in 1997 a program called Project Archimedes, and it had e excellent results in building the party membership. But unfortunately, the leadership of the party abandoned uh, the program when it still had a long way to run and a lot of ground, uh, new ground that could have been covered uh, for prospecting, but it did serve to increase the membership, uh, more than double the membership in a relatively short period of time. And that plus the 96 campaign actually resulted in an increase in membership from 9,500 people in 1994 to over 34,000 people in the year 2000. But then the whole process of building membership was just thrown out the window and people got all excited about this, that, or some other thing. But I think if it had continued on the same path, we could hope to have a couple of hundred thousand members in, uh, let us say, by two 2006, uh, if not by 2004, we would have had them. And with 200,000 members, it would not be too difficult to produce a, a presidential campaign with a minimum of $10 million, which would be all the difference in the world. Uh, the Bad Merit campaign only had about a million dollars to, to spend this year. There are some other things that I can bring up later with regard to what this suggests, what my approach suggests uh, with regard to how to advertise, uh, what kind of bumper stickers and, and yard signs we should have and so on. But I'll leave that now because we've got people waiting on the phone and I've gotten already a bunch of emails from people with thoughts about this and I want to get your thoughts on this. The phone number is 1-800-259-9231 and if Stu in Texas has not given up on me and is still on the phone, then I will say good evening, Stu. Good evening, Harry. Sorry to keep you waiting. Oh, you know, I don't mind waiting for you to listen to you. No way. Well, thank but, you. Uh, now we want to listen to you. Other hosts, <laughs> I would have hung up long ago, but you you, know, you have so much wisdom, I, I, I sit for hours. Well, thank you. But uh, for the first time, unfortunately, since the early 70s, uh, when I read your book, How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World, and was introduced to your ideas, uh, I have to find, my, I find myself disagreeing with you uh, uh, on, on this issue. But uh, before that, I, I'd like to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I see this country, the United States, becoming a an evil combination of Nazi Germany and the Taliban. 
and I don't want to live in it anymore. So could you give me some recommendation as to a country that I could go to where they speak English because at uh, around 60 years of age, I have a very hard time learning foreign languages. I understand. My uh, Deutsch is sehr schlecht. Where uh, they uh, uh, revere liberty. Well, unfortunately, there's no country in the world that would probably meet your standards, but there are countries that might be... Uh, more peaceful and uh, less living in a state of siege than the United States. In fact, practically any country in the world would qualify outside of the Middle East. Uh, I don't know uh, well, all the countries of the yeah, yeah. I don't know all the countries of the world, but I did live in Switzerland for six years. It's been 20 years since I moved back to the United States, so I'm not really sure what the situation is there now. But I suspect that it is a lot better than it is in the United States as far as personal liberties are concerned, and certainly it is a less dangerous country than the United States has become as a result of the United States foreign policy. What and, would it involve to move there? Well, you'd have to get a residence permit, so you'd have to go over there and visit. You'd have to look around and make sure that this is where you want to live, uh -huh. and you would then have to find an attorney who could help you get a residence permit because uh, you don't want to do it on your own. Uh, you want to talk. You want to have on your side somebody who really knows the ropes over there and what's going on. Now, understand that a lot of people in Switzerland speak English, and I got by there without being a fluent German speaker. I was in the German section of the country living right. in Zurich. There also are French and Italian sections, uh, so if you're, you happen to have uh, experience in one of those languages, you probably want to live in that area. Uh, even living in England, in some ways would be better than living in the United States, but in other ways... Socialized it, medicine? But in, I was going to say, in other ways, it would be a lot worse. Uh, so if you're, you're going to have the situation that there are going, there's going to be good and bad about any country, and what you're hoping to do is to find a country where the good things are the things that, are, that they have are the ones that are really precious to you, and the bad things about that country are ones that are fairly irrelevant for you, that don't touch you. That's the way I felt about Switzerland when I lived there. Well, I, 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 could, I, I couldn't mow my lawn on Sunday afternoon because of a local ordinance, but that didn't bother me. The privacy, I enjoyed, and I loved it. The fact that I, I felt insulated from the re rest of the world and prying eyes from the U.S government and so on. So the, the, the assets there were ones that were important to me, and the liabilities were ones that didn't bother me. And uh, strangely enough, I just got an email from Eric saying, other than possibly medieval I Iceland and maybe the original America under the Articles of Configuration, can you give us any examples of a successful libertarian society? Um, I see. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have looked at this uh, so casually. I thought he was talking about present day, but he was looking for examples from the past. But he does says, say, do you know anything about New Zealand? I have seen some writings that indicate that they've been able to shrink government somewhat. Any comments on New Zealand? Well, I've read that too. I think that New Zealand and Australia both present possibilities because they're English-speaking countries, and they are far away from the wars of the day, which may be one of the worst dangers possible. Even in socialized medicine company, uh, countries, you can still get private medical treatment. It just might be uh, somewhat expensive, but then it's somewhat expensive in the United States as well. So uh, I definitely would look to an English-speaking country unless you uh, have... Uh, uh, facility and languages, or you're young enough to be able to acquire a new one. Stu, yeah, what were you going to say? Uh, what about Ireland? Well, Ireland uh, perhaps might be a good country, but I've got to tell you that I have not investigated this very much. I, uh -huh. I've always felt very partial to Switzerland because of the six wonderful years that I spent there. Uh -huh. but, but I came back to the United States partly because I was homesick. Uh -huh. there, there are things you just don't get in those countries. And, and I was coming to the United States four or six times a year for various business purposes and so on. So even with that, I still felt homesick for Big Macs and things of that sort, which, which were not commonplace over there. Well, uh uh, just to give you an idea of where I stand, okay, my motto is Ubi Libertas Ubi Patria, the same as James Otis, and that means where liberty is, there is my country. Uh, yeah, did Thomas Paine say that? No, that was James Otis. Oh, sorry. Right. You said that. But he was, that was his motto, okay. and I took it upon and took it for my own. Well, if you but, find find out anything, uh, Stu, you might call back and uh, enlighten other people listening to this show. Well, I'd also like to talk about how I disagree with you on this issue concerning... Oh, concerning the Libertarian Party. Yeah, that's where we were going as a, to begin with. Uh, yeah, uh, okay. Uh, let's have it uh, somewhat briefly because we've got some other people waiting now. Uh, okay, well, I can kind of uh, put it in a nutshell. When I ran for Congress mm -hmm. from District 16 against Sylvester Reyes here in El Paso, uh, before, but prior to my running, I was a frequent guest on all kinds of radio, TV shows. Uh, I, I was a frequent guest columnist in our local newspaper, and, and I had all kinds of outlets. Or, uh, libertarian thought. Mm -hmm. As soon as I announced my candidacy, everything dried up completely. I was not uh, even invited to the forum, the candidate forum. Uh, when I would uh, finally uh, get permission to speak to a high school audience, for example, uh, to the faculty and so forth in mm -hmm. an assembly, a couple of days later I was uh, called on the phone and told that I had been canceled. Uh, so 
Well, but, I don't think you're disagreeing with me. I think what you're saying well, no, no. is that you haven't. Your own experience was that you did better when you weren't a candidate than you were. But this again is one reason that the national presidential campaign is so helpful because it could fill in a lot of the gaps that you experienced as a local candidate. Well, I would make a suggestion as to how we could. I, I think the problem is, for example, if you look at the vote totals for Budnerik as opposed to yours, yeah. they were about the same. Okay. Correct. And you had much, much more exposure on the media than he did, mm -hmm. all right? And, of course, it's one thing to tell people about something, but to illustrate it through reality is another. And what I'm getting at is I think that one way that we libertarians can get liberty in the minds of people in a real way is to, uh, as individuals, advertise libertarian ideas. I mean, we don't have to get a newspaper to print our columns. We can go out and for a few dollars print a, a flyer uh -huh. and distribute them and with the express purpose of getting enough people to contribute, to donate, to buy a full-page ad in a newspaper uh, advertising our ideas. And particularly, pick one particular problem that government causes and present a libertarian solution to that problem and bring it about so well, that people can look at what has been done and see that, hey, they're not just full of air. They sure. really did something. No, I think we follow that. I think if you can get that done, you should do it. And I think that in the same way other people are going to have other ideas, and they should do what they think best. I agree. And, but uh, I, I just wanted to throw that out for everybody who is sure. listening to maybe they'll start in their own communities doing things like that. I'm trying Good. to get rid of the government from the schools now. Good. Stu, thanks okay. so much for your call. We'll thanks. be back in just a couple of minutes, and I hope you don't go away. Let's continue talking to people on the telephone, and now we have Matt in Connecticut. Good evening, Matt. Hello, Harry. What's up? Uh, I'd just like to say that I agree in pretty much all the points you made on the beginning of the show. Um, and also, I'd like to uh, point out a few things I've noticed after the uh, election from some libertarians I know. Sure. Um, well, through the Internet, I know some forums that are libertarian-related. And I've noticed there's some people that are either in the party or just kind of observe the party from the outside. And some people, they, they have, like, this idea that there needs to be, like, a compromise to get a libertarian in office. And, and people don't understand it. it. It should be quality over quantity, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Uh, in other words, they're saying that uh, libertarians should compromise their principles in order to get elected? Yeah. Like, for example, like uh, the drug war, they say that first we should eliminate uh, marijuana prohibition, but not something like heroin prohibition, and they don't realize that that's a hypocrisy in itself, because how are you against a drug war if you want certain drugs prohibited and not... Right, and plus, plus, as long as heroin continues to be prohibited, then we're going to have gang warfare uh, financed by the drug trade and a lot of other social ills. And it's the libertarian candidate's job to point this out and to make people realize that these wonderful intentions that politicians display lead to disastrous results. And it's a perf the drug war is a perfect example of misguided thinking. And if you can convince somebody on that, then you've pretty well convinced them on 90% of the issues. Yeah, yes, I agree. And um, also another point I wanted to make is... Uh, uh, a lot of people I've noticed are, you know, quite negative that, you know, the tally of votes, but they just look at it this way. Look at how the other third parties did. I mean... Yes, Badnerik got yeah. apparently a, a total equal to all of those below him, which was about 10 other candidates uh, who together amassed only about the same vote total that Badnerik got. And Badnerik got within about 17 or 20,000 votes of what Nader got. So, obviously, uh, he can't be faulted on the vote total. Yeah, yeah and, I, you know, I, I've been trying to say that, but, you know, some people are just negative and I don't know what it is some people just you know they find something to be negative about and they just continue being negative oh sure and uh, it's in the nature of some people plus uh, they didn't get their way this year in some way and so they've got to take it out on whoever did get their way and try to point out how wrong those people were I'm going to write an article on this uh, Matt so you might keep in mind that uh, it, it'll be on the website probably by Monday or Tuesday and uh, you can refer people to it at harrybrown.org and it'll be about the libertarian vote total and what the party needs to do a note from uh, Shane says, interesting thing about Republicans, at the local, state, and federal level, Republican politicians have violated every principle their party stands for. They've raised taxes while pretending they haven't. They've increased debt. They've increased budgets, granted entitlements, and so on. And what happens? More Republicans vote for them. So why should we trust them to make government smaller, be fiscally responsible, and so forth? Republicans aren't punishing their politicians for betraying their principles. In fact, they reward them by putting them back in office. Well, of course, uh, Shane, that's what we've been saying all along on this show, that the first thing you must do if you want smaller government is to quit supporting those who are making government and bigger because you're just encouraging them to do what they've been doing. All right, let's go back to the phones and talk with Roger in Clymer, New York. Good evening, Roger. What's on your mind tonight? Well, good evening, Harry. Thanks for taking my call. Well, Harry, I, I prefer to look at the election as something in, in a different way. Which is? Well, I prefer to think um, 
that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So I'm looking at the 51% of the people that voted for uh, the re-elected president and the 49 or 48%, whatever, that voted for his Democratic challenger. They're all actually insane because they're voting for something, thinking that something will be changed, and it won't. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly George Bush isn't going to suddenly change from everything that he did in the first four years and be a different kind of president and do all the things that he promised in 2000 but never even proposed in the next four years. So uh, it would be somewhat insane to think that George Bush is going to be different in the next four years. That is true. Uh, Also, George Bush would say, take a look at what my hometown newspaper says about me. Well, his hometown newspaper the day before endorsed his Democratic opponent. Well, who was that? The the Crawford Bugle, or yeah, I think it was. Let's see. It, it, was it uh, a major uh, metropolitan paper, or just something out there by his ranch? Uh, it was something out there by his ranch. Okay. Well, uh, they have a lot of the material out on those ranches there that can go into campaign promises and editorials alike. But we won't need to identify what that is. Yeah. Uh, let's see. It was. Yeah, I've got. I've got it. Say it here. It says. It starts out, few Americans would have voted for George W. Bush four years ago if he promised that as president he would empty the Social Security Trust Fund. Of course, it was empty before that, but, you know. Well, it's emptier now. Yeah, it's emptier now. To help offset fiscal irresponsibility, cut Medicare by 17% and reduce, you know, whatever. Um, eliminate overtime pay, raise oil prices 50%. Give tax cuts to business. You know, you know, all these things, he sits mm-hmm. there and says. Sure. Um, Involve this country in a deadly and highly questionable war. <laughs> well, you can say that about anybody. You know, you can say that about Clinton. Well, there's nothing questionable about the, law, the war. We all know what it is. Right. And, and uh, talk about insanity. But it's interesting that the, even the arguments against Bush are not always true, that neither side can resist just uh, embellishing so much on whatever the truth about something is. So, in any event, uh, it is interesting that his local paper uh, doesn't think that much of him, and that's not unusual, but he shouldn't be making a point that people who know him best would tell you what a great guy he is. Um, Okay, Roger, thanks so much for your call. As always, glad to hear from you. Let's talk now to James in Oregon. Good evening, James. Good evening, Harry. Welcome to the War on Terror. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) But I've already been there. I don't want to come back. (laughs) Well, George George Bush is going to take you there anyway, along with the uh, other 250 million Americans. Because he's got capital now. Yeah, yeah, right. He's got <laughs> political capital, and yeah, he's going to spend it. Spend it. There you go. War on Terror 101. Um, why am I calling? i got two words about the election, by the way. What are they? Evil EPROMs. And those mean that what? The EPROMs in the voting machines made by Diebold. When are we going to see somebody uh, take those apart and find out what happened to our vote? Because I don't think, honestly, they won. <laughs> I think it's in the software. I mean, look, the vote totals don't match the exit polls. There's a whole bunch of other little tidbits of information that all lead to the same conclusion, Harry. Well, Evil EPROMs. We will never gotta, know. Got to take a look at those. We probably will never know. Well, we could we could take a look at the EPROMs, see if they were uh, using the correct algorithms. Mm-hmm. Anyway. You mean, you mean what you're saying is look at the programs themselves that counted the votes. The software. Uh, Harry, yeah, yeah, right. That was in the details. Um, it's like, uh, what's his name, Stalin said, uh, I don't care, you know, <laughs> how the election is run as long as I count the votes. Sure. I'm paraphrasing, of course. <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, anyway, right. uh, you, you're, you're having a show on, on how to spread libertarian ideas. Mm-hmm. How about a new office in, in the... Um, Libertarian National Committee, uh, non-monetary uh, goals. <laughs> um, and it would consist of just people uh, contributing their uh, skills to uh, have projects that don't involve monetary um, contributions, mm-hmm. such as helping all libertarians um, build a website. And, in fact, uh, showing them that they can walk into a, an office depot and purchase uh, you know, $4.50 worth of business cards that they can make on the computer. You mm-hmm. hand out these business cards, to your website, which of course contains a link to the Libertarian Party. Right, and the and party, can, party yeah. could provide a framework of a website that you could uh, get, right, get from them and just put your name on it. Right, because you know what? Every time you hire an IST nowadays, you get a free website. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you, know, you get a free website. Yeah, what about right. teaching Libertarians that, hey, you can use this space to advertise Libertarian ideas and hand out business cards, like I posted my business card on bulletin boards, and people like it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, good thinking, James. It's non-monetary, though, too. Sure. No, and there's probably plenty of other things, as you're alluding to. And uh, so why don't you send a note to Libertarian Party headquarters, and who knows, maybe somebody will read it. And we've been getting some interesting ideas from people around the country, and now we're going to get one from Guy in Colorado. Good evening, Guy. Uh, good evening, Mr. Brown. I have a question that isn't uh, entirely related, related to uh, on the Libertarian Party, mm-hmm. but I have a question that you raised in your book, The Economic Time Bomb. Yes. And it's about the trade deficit. Uh, in most of the newsletters that I read, they make a great issue of, about the trade deficit, which I understand is about $500, $500 billion now. Something gigantic. Yeah, gigantic. And in your book, you mentioned that the trade deficit is really a non-problem. 
Right. And and I wonder if you if you think that today with that gigantic trade deficit, does that really um, make a a real serious problem with uh, you know with investments? That that's my well, it is an overrated uh, situation. It's something that people can point to with alarm, uh, especially investment advisors, and say, oh, with this trade deficit, we need to do the following things, as I have been telling you all along. But the fact of the matter is that there is no overall imbalance in trade. Trade, all, uh, not pardon me, not trade, but balance of payments always has to be imbalanced. And what is uh, a deficit in the trade uh, account will be offset by a surplus in the investment account, meaning that the money that Americans spend on foreign goods, they spend dollars on these things, and the dollars wind up in Italy and China and France and all these other places. Those dollars really wind up in New York City, in New York banks, or in New York brokerage houses, or uh, at other places where uh, American bonds, American stocks, American CDs, and so on are purchased. Uh, and one offsets the other, and they always come out in balance. They have to come out in balance. But the question is, which of the two accounts is driving the other? It may be that foreigners want to invest in the U.S., and the result is is that Americans have to use what the investments are, uh, the equivalent of the investments, to buy foreign goods. And so the prices of foreign goods reflect this in order to soak up those uh, dollars that are going into American investments. Or it may be the other way around, that those dollars are accumulating overseas because of Americans' purchases, and they wind up back here as American investments. But either way, if something goes too far, people will just no longer do business with you before a- anymore. It's, it's like people saying there's too much debt in this country. Well, if there's too much debt, then it's going to be reflected in the fact that people are not going to be good credit risks and other people aren't going to want to lend them money anymore. And these things have a way of, of uh, balancing themselves out or of swinging backward uh, because the free market is, is made up of people who are acting in their own self-interest and they're not going to do things that are not in their self-interest or at least are not perceived to be in their self-interest. So uh, it just is not going to happen that this is going to lead to some disaster on its own. I remember in 20 years ago or so, I was at an investment conference and I heard a man say, in another 10 years, we won't be producing any products in the United States anymore. We'll be buying them all from, we'll be getting them all from Japan. And I happened to follow the guy on the platform and I got and said, geez, that's a great, best news I've heard in my lifetime. This means we don't have to work anymore. The Japanese are going to provide everything that we need. And, of course, it was ridiculous. Why would the Japanese do that? Uh, the only reason that they will uh, send goods over here is we're, is we're sending something back, but if we're not producing anything, how can we possibly do business with them? So these things have to, to work themselves out on their own, and there's no reason to get alarmed over them. Well, that's yeah, a longer what, answer than you wanted. I see what you mean, but now what I hear is that, like China, where we are buying all of their manufactured goods, they have low labor costs, and then they have accumulated, along with uh, Japan, uh, billions and billions of dollars, mm-hmm. U.S. dollars. Okay, so now let's say that, and, and what they do then, the way I understand it, is that they buy, with these dollars, they buy billions of dollars of our treasuries. Mm-hmm. And in doing that, then I... Then we're uh, dependent upon them to keep those treasuries. Right, so and let's, if, let's if say they, that they, they, instead of buying the treasuries, that they use that money to buy gold or, or like this Noranda company in Canada. Right, and then... And what happens to the dollar? Right. Well, the fact is that they own a very small percentage of all the money that's in Treasury securities. And the fact that Chinese own them is no different from Americans owning them. People in Chicago may get very worried about the future of the dollar and sell all their bonds and buy Swiss francs or something else or buy gold. It doesn't matter whether they're Chinese or Americans or Indians or or, uh, Martians. The fact is that it's just a question of what is the future of the dollar, what is the future of debt in this country, and so on, and people make these decisions. But some people get focused on the foreigners doing this, and because they're focused on the foreigners, it makes it sound like we are dependent on the goodwill of the Chinese and so forth, and that we're not going to have that goodwill forever. Well, we may not have the goodwill of the bond traders in Chicago, or the mutual funds, uh, American mutual funds that have been holding bonds and are scared to hold them anymore. Uh, it really doesn't matter where the people are who are holding these bonds. The, the point is, what do you see as the future of the dollar? And right now, I have no opinion on it, but then again, I never do, because I don't believe anybody can predict the future anyway. That's why I think you need a permanent portfolio, one that's well-balanced and diversified, so that you don't have to predict the future, because you're not going to be successful at it. You may be right every once in a while, and you'll remember that for the rest of your life, but the rule, uh, the, the usual situation will be that your predictions will not turn out the way you expected them to, and the things that seem just so inevitable that have to happen within the next two or three years won't happen. Everything that I hear about people, about what's the trade deficit's going to cause, about people dumping their dollars and starting a run on the dollar. All of these things that I hear today, I heard 10 years ago. I heard them 20 years ago. I heard them 30 years ago. And maybe someday they will happen. Maybe next year they'll happen. Maybe they won't happen for another 30 years. Maybe they'll never happen. I don't know, but my experience tells me not to get alarmed by any of these things and not to let anybody stampede me into over-investing in some one particular item, which then will make me extremely vulnerable to things not working out the way I expected that they would. But, but what 
what if, what if foreigners that don't buy our bonds? Well, somebody here might buy the bonds. It's not who buys them. It's whether people in general are buying them, Americans or foreigners. Uh, hang on. We've got to take a break. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. So, any final thoughts you have on this guy? Yeah. Uh, in case, let's say that Americans and foreigners both uh, refuse to buy the Treasury bonds because the interest rate is almost nothing, and the value of the dollar has declined in the last several years anywhere from, let's say, 10 to 30%. Uh, so if they quit buying because it's not a good investment, then will the Federal Reserve have to monetize that uh, debt by printing more money? Okay, well, first of all, we have to realize that that's why there are prices in the market, and the way the market works is that when something goes out of demand, the price changes, or when something is overly demanded, the price changes. So when you say people refuse to buy the bonds because the interest rate is too low, then the interest rate will rise, and the interest rate will rise to whatever point is necessary to sell the bonds. I mean, in the worst inflation, they sold bonds in Brazil and Argentina and Chile, uh, but the bonds were yielding 100% a year or more uh, as a result to make up for the inflation. But I, I don't foresee that in the United States in the near future, but what I'm saying is that if the bonds uh, go out of favor, then uh, the interest rate will rise to 5% or 6% or 8%. Uh, in the um, late 1970s and early 1980s, Treasury bills were going for about 17% uh, yield, yield, something like that, and Treasury bonds around 12 or 14%. And, of course, then after a while, those yields came down, the interest rates came down. So the market adjusts to meet whatever the supply and demand situation is. But is, but is China and Japan, are they trapped in, in buying our Treasuries? Because the American dollar has been the reserve currency for the world until recently the euro has come somewhat into focus. Well, they don't have to buy treasuries. They can buy American stocks. They can use the dollars for other purposes, or they can sell the dollars on the market and buy Swiss francs with them, and somebody else can decide what to do with the dollars. The market will work its way out, and that's what people who provide scare stories don't realize too often, is that that's how markets work. They react to what is going on, and they change the prices of things, and they make some things more attractive than they were and other things less attractive than they were to compensate for the conditions that exist. That's why, in the first place, that people like you and me and other listeners to this broadcast promote the free market as an alternative to government because government doesn't respond rationally to how things happen, but people acting in their own self-interest do. And the one of the further aspects of this is that a great many of the scare stories that you hear come from people who don't understand the free market well enough. This is what happened with Y2K. I wrote articles before Y2K telling how the market was going to take care of this and uh, saying that the people who were promoting the Y2K scare were assuming that there were all kinds of business executives in this country who had no concept of self-interest whatsoever and were quite willing to walk, walk off the uh, edge of a cliff with their companies rather than do whatever was necessary to make sure that they could handle whatever problems there might be with Y2K. People do act in their own self-interest, and that's how markets fluctuate. Uh, let's wrap this up, Guy. Cause okay, well, I appreciate your analysis, and I think you've helped me. Oh, good. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks yeah. so much for calling. Yeah, thank you, Harry. All right, let's take a few emails here. I want to take especially the ones that have to do with what we've been talking tonight about uh, with regards to the Libertarian Party. Brian asks, do you know the reason the LP can't get Clint Eastwood or a libertarian with his level of notoriety to run for president for the LP? The media exposure would be huge and couldn't be ignored. Well, in the first place, I can't see somebody like Clint Eastwood or Kurt Russell uh, just giving up his career for a year or so and his earning capacity to be able to do something like that. And I'm not sure that a celebrity is what we want. When you actually pin these celebrities down, people who say they're libertarian, you find that, well, no, they certainly wouldn't want to do away with the gun laws. That would be irresponsible. And I think we should go very slow on this drug issue and maybe not even talk about it at all. I mean, for a while there, Bill Meyer... Uh, uh, was said to be a libertarian with his politically incorrect show and so on, and he still calls himself a libertarian from time to time. But it turned out that the two issues that he was mostly concerned about was the income tax, because he was a high earner, and the drug war. And I don't know what his motivation was there. And he was pretty much anti-war on Iraq, but he certainly believes in government regulation and other things. And he's sort of a liberal libertarian, or maybe a libertarian liberal. And he would not be an ideal person to be carrying the libertarian message. Uh, what we need, first and foremost, is to make sure that the libertarian message is the libertarian message. And so I'm not all that uh, excited about a celebrity. All that would do would be to get some attention and some vote totals that we might not get otherwise, but it might not do anything in terms of building for the future. When the campaign is over, the celebrity goes back to his work, and we are left uh, exactly where we were at the beginning of the campaign. All right, Joe says, while vote totals may be considered meaningless, I think the trends do not bode well. Uh, take Massachusetts, for example, where the vote total went down in spite of the fact that it was a, uh, a state solidly in the Democratic column, and so therefore nobody had any particular inducement to vote for a carrier of Bush. Well, Joe, the point is that it doesn't really matter whether the vote total is going up or down. 
we're in the nether ranges, and that's not the object of a campaign right now. I realize that maybe the bad Narek people made it the object of the campaign, and they wanted to get a million votes and so on. I would have loved to get a million votes in the year 2000. But that shouldn't be the object of the campaign, and we shouldn't be agonizing over whether this... Um, the, the vote total in any particular year goes up or down. What we should worry about is how much we're building a party where we'll be able to do things that we can't do today. Philip says, I read an article about Michael Badnerick where it stated that he didn't carry around a driver's license or pay income tax for a number of years. I've heard you speak about those that don't pay their income tax, so you don't need to comment on about that or a bad narrative situation specifically. However, how do you feel about those people that decide to live their lives like this, for instance, where they refuse to carry a driver's license? Well, that's something that each individual has to decide for himself. I decided I will have a driver's license. I will pay my income tax, but I have nothing against people who decide otherwise. I think this is something that everybody has to weigh for himself. There are a lot of cons to that, and on the other hand, people may feel that they're living more by principle if they do not in any way cooperate with the government by going in and getting a driver's license. All right, let's take some more emails. Jan out there in cyberspace says that there is a sixth barrier to alternative parties. I gave five legal barriers that exist, barriers that have been put in place by the Republicans and Democrats to keep third parties from getting to the point where they could replace one of the two major parties. And Jan says that the sixth barrier is our plurality voting system, which creates voter incentives to vote incentives to vote for the lesser of two evils, thus perpetuating the two-party system. And you're right about that, Jan. We are just about, I think, the only major Western country that does have this kind of plurality voting system where anybody that comes in third has no representation in the government at all. And he says we should work to implement better voting methods such as approval voting, instant round-robin voting, or instant runoff voting. And um, he says Democrat and Republican politicians are getting hurt by the spoiler effect and are becoming more interested in better voting methods that avoid, avoid this effect. Now is a great, great time to promote better voting methods in preparation for new state legislative sessions next year. Well, my opinion on this may differ from yours, and I think everybody should follow his own star on this, but it's my belief that it will be easier to elect a libertarian president than to change the voting system. I just don't think that the politicians are going to approve a change in the voting system when, in the final analysis, it benefits them to have the exact system that we have now. And so it's pretty hard for me to imagine how we are going to convince the politicians to do something that's not in their own self-interest. But I may be overlooking something, and I won't quarrel with anybody who wants to work to change the voting system. Jonathan says, the 2004 presidential election was extremely bad for liberty and bad for the Libertarian Party. First, I wouldn't be surprised if President Bush decides to invade another country and escalate his assault on the Bill of Rights after winning the election as America's fearless leader in the war on terrorism. Well, I can't disagree with you there, Jonathan. It's a real danger, and we can see it just by this uh, great assault that they're going to make on Fallujah any moment now, and a lot of people are going to be killed, and it's obvious that George Bush wouldn't have allowed that to happen two weeks ago. But now that he's safely in for another four years, it doesn't matter how many people die, it can't hurt his re-election returns. Jonathan goes ahead, uh, goes on to say, second, Michael Badnarik not only did poorly as far as votes, but he also received little national media attention. I would be shocked if LP membership has increased much as a result of his campaign. The problem, uh, Jonathan, is I don't know that his campaign actually sought out the national media attention. We had two full-time people, and these were paid staff. Uh, not volunteers, so they were in the office every day for 8, 10, 12, 14 hours, Jim Babka and Robert Bruner, who were calling and making these appointments. They were not waiting to hear from people, but actually doing their own outreach to media outlets. And they did a fantastic job of getting me on national television shows. I was on David Asman's uh, news report on Fox News seven times during the, the campaign, just from February to November. I was on Hannity and Combs six times during the campaign. I was on the O'Reilly Factor three times. I was on C-SPAN about eight times altogether during the campaign. And this was because of hard, dedicated work. And I know that the Bad Nera campaign may have made the mistake of thinking that they should rely on volunteers. Volunteers can never do the job that paid staff can do. And when I say paid staff, I sort of say that tongue-in-cheek because those people on our staff didn't get paid every week the way they were supposed to. And some of them forgave what was owed to them at the end of the campaign. And all of them gave up better-paying careers to come to Washington and work on the campaign. So uh, they certainly didn't get rich on the campaign. But it is necessary to go out and get those interviews, and I'm not sure that this campaign did. But I eagerly await uh, a report from them to know exactly what did go on. They may have faced some barriers that I don't know about, so I don't want to judge them. Uh, Jonathan goes on finally to say, I know you say that we should enjoy our lives and not let politics get us down, but I think any psychologically sane libertarians should feel dejected right now. I don't think that that's true. I think that if the campaign did not do what it should have done, well, a, an opportunity was wasted. But it doesn't mean that we can't do more in 2008. And I hope to 
do something to help make that happen in 2008, promote a candidate who's really got his eyes on, on uh, the future and is really determined to do the things that are necessary to help build the party. I look back on my campaign in 2004, and I think we were successful in a lot of ways, but we made some mistakes, some mistakes that somebody could learn from uh, to avoid and not have to reinvent the wheel and make the same mistakes all over again. Uh, we, there were things we should have done. We should have seen at the time that we should do them and didn't do. So in any event, I think that it is possible to in- improve upon what's happened, and I will not rest. I will continue to try to do so. And we have been talking tonight mostly about the future of the Libertarian Party after the election. And one last email, Matt in Salt Lake City, says some wealthy Libertarians may not want to run for president because of the enormous amount of time and effort that has to be put into a campaign. Well, he's right about that. I mean, it is a full-time job, and someone would have to give up being the CEO of his company or something else for about a solid year at a minimum. And... That is a lot to ask for somebody, but Matt points out that uh, that same person could run as the vice presidential candidate and put his money into the campaign because you can set it up as a joint campaign, meaning Smith and Jones for president and vice president, and set up the campaign committee that way, and Jones could then put fifteen, twenty, twenty-five million dollars into the campaign, which would really be spent on Smith as the presidential candidate, but more important, spent on elevating name recognition for the libertarian label. So that's a very important point, and I'm glad Matt brought it up that what we might be able to do is at some point in the future to get a wealthy libertarian to run as the vice presidential candidate and combine him with a very articulate presidential candidate who then we don't need to worry about what he's going to say because we know he's going to give a straight libertarian message. Lastly tonight, referring back to what Jonathan said about being despondent, I think it's very important for us to continue our efforts and to not worry about any intermediate results. Uh, the Cold War ended when nobody expected it to end. Suddenly everything turned around. And I told the story before of being amazed when the Hungarians suddenly opened the borders to the and raised the Iron Curtain. Same thing can happen here. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. And we don't want to be consumed by it so that we uh, depend completely for our happiness on the future of American society. Live your life. Enjoy it. Devote a small part of it to doing something for liberty. But make the most of this opportunity you have to live. This is Harry Brown. Hope you'll be back next week. Good night.